excited. We're so, so excited to have you here with us. And we have a full packed content for you today. But before we get started, we would like to know where you're joining in from. So wherever you're joining in from, just type that in the chat. Are you joining from the United States of America? Are you joining from Canada, Brazil? You know, wherever you're joining from, are you joining from Nigeria? would like to know where you're joining from. So just type that in the chat in a second so we know where we are joining from. Thank you. I can see the United States of America. That's, that's nice. That's great. Yeah, I can see just Nigeria. This is amazing. Nigeria, this is amazing. Egypt. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, we can see people joining from all over the world. This is so, so wonderful. Yes, yeah, so I am Esther Ayinder and I will be your course on this first session of Kunle Adewali Day. Joining me on stage today is the ever energetic Franca. And Franca would be introducing herself in a minute. Franca, can you please introduce yourself to the participants? Hi, thank you very much, Esther. Looking beautiful as always. And hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Like she has rightly said, my name is Franca, joining in from Botakot, Nigeria. And I will also be a co-host. Looking forward to having fun in this session and learning so much. Back to you, Esther. Wonderful. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Franca. And trust me, guys, we have a well-packed content for you today, and it's going to be an enjoyable experience all through Kunle Day 2021. I know a lot of people have been asking questions, who is really Kunle, who is Kunle Adewale really, and why do we have to celebrate Kunle Adewale Day every single year? And Franca will be doing justice to that in just a minute telling us why Kunle Adewali and who really is Kunle Adewali. Franca, over to you. Thank you, Esther. This, that is a question we're answering to everyone who doesn't already know. Mr. Kunle Adewali is so many things to so many people. But on this auspicious day, I want to let you know, just give you a little bit about who he really is and why we're celebrating him. Mr. Kunle Adewale is an award-winning international artist and a young African leader from Nigeria who actively engaged with the community in Cincinnati, Ohio, US, USA for 11 days. He's the co-founder of Arts in Medicine Fellowship, Tender Arts Nigeria, and Arts in Medicine <laughs> Project. Can we mute ourselves if we're not speaking please thank you while mr kunle was invited to cincinnati ohio to serve as the eye of the artist foundation's first international artist in thank you i noticed that was muted <laughs> sorry everyone so Mr. Kunle was invited to Cincinnati, Ohio to serve as the Eye of the Artist Foundation's first international artist in residence. And during this time, he was hosted by Annie Ruth, who is also an international artist in the United States and the founder and creative director of Eye of the Artist Foundation. He stayed with her between August 2nd to August 12th of 2019. And during his time in the United States, he shared artist talks with students and professionals, provided art sessions with patients, caregivers, healthcare workers, and other teaching assistants in the community. If you do know Mr. Kunle Adewale, you know this is just a regular day for him. On the 2nd of August, 2019, the mayor of Ohio, Mayor John Cranley, declared August 2nd, 2019 as Kunle Adewale's day in Cincinnati, Ohio, in honor of his trailblazing career of arts and medicine and the impact it had made. Kunle Adewale's day is dedicated to serve humanity through creative engagement 
in communities in the United States as well as in Nigeria. And a day like this is not just to celebrate him, but to remind us that we are part of the greater good. And we have an opportunity to make the world a better place. Today, we are going to do some sober reflection. We are going to tap into this spectacular man's potential and see how we also can be agents for social change. Back to you, Esther. Wow, that was a wonderful introduction, Franca. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. But as they say, videos speaks a thousand words. And that is why we would be watching some documentary on Kumi Adewale. The documentary will be taking us through his journey, right from when he was a child to when he made all those trail billing experiences that Franca mentioned earlier. The first being, Kunle Adewale future as a change maker on the continent of Africa by Ebony Life TV. This documentary was powered by Heritage Bank. The documentary will be starting in a second. Whilst we wait from the for the documentary, we know we have a couple of people join that joined um, right after we started the session. Um, so can we just put in the chat where we're joining from and just say hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening in our country's language whilst we wait for the documentary to play. I can see, good morning. Oh, that's Esther. That's how we say good morning in the US. I can see Ekaro. I hope I pronounced that well. <laughs> yeah, that Yoruba. is. Yoruba. Yeah, I can, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ekaro in Yoruba. That is. Oh, also Karen is saying it as well from USA. Ekaro. Ekaro. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. I, I think I'm a bit curious as to what people hope to gain from this session. Let's know our expectations, let's socialize. Do you hope to meet new people? Do you hope to learn something new? Do you hope to just pass time? Do you hope to know Mr. Kunle Adewale a bit more? Or do you hope to know how you can have a day named after you? Let's know your motivations <laughs> for joining Franca, us today. I think I would like to know how to have a day named after me. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. If we have more people responding to that, then maybe we can host another session. We can ask Mr. Kunde to cut soap for us, probably. Yeah, like some soap. I wouldn't mind, Franka. You know, <laughs> named, named after, after me in the United States and Canada, and, you know, almost in every yeah. country of the world. Yeah. Okay. I can see Emmanuel. Okay. All right, all right. Is the documentary starting now, Esther? Yeah, it's starting now. It's starting in a minute. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, there we go. My name is Kunya Dewali, um, the CEO of Tender Art Nigeria. I'm also a Mandela Washington Fellow. Um, I'm a visual artist. 
I work with um, girls using that as an empowerment for them. I also work with um, people living with disabilities uh, like Down syndrome. I also engage in art therapy uh, with um, people living with cancer, children and young persons living with cancer in Nigeria, and also people living with um, sickle cell anemia too, using art as a form of engagement to help them get better and get well. Well, um, at the time in my life as an artist, I asked myself, what will I do differently? I made a discovery and I ventured into it, working in the hospital space, engaging children and young people living with cancer. And you can see the joy, you can see the happiness. Art is just like a magic. Yeah, I work with some um, children in Nigeria, Pakistan, um, through ICS, even through art program. And um, so far, we have reached out to over 10,000 IDPs in Northeast Nigeria through healing through arts. Yeah, um, I started my career as an artist as far back as, um, let's say, about 15 years ago. But um, I started my organization about um, three years ago, Tender as Nigeria, and uh, we've impacted over 5,000 people in Nigeria through our talent de development programs. And um, there are also um, community development programs too. Uh, well, the response has been very, very remarkable. Um, through our art therapy program, we've been able to fundraise for foundation. And then people come around and see some of these works like, wow, this was done by children who have cancer, this was done by people who have sickle cell. And so it's not about. Um, the pain they are going through is the fact is that they can draw positive energy through art and create something beautiful in their lives. Putting money first was the wrong advice that anybody would actually give me because I'm value driven. You create value, money will flow. Have the best is to follow my passion and make it happen. One of my goals is to be the biggest inspiration to African children and young people and um, I want to create an enterprise where people who are undeserved, people who are underprivileged can come and benefit for free. Um, having a gallery, having a conference center where people can come and learn and that will be my contribution to knowledge. We do have a centre, um, we presently partnering with um, Super Cell Foundation Nigeria and uh, where we do our art therapy programs and uh, we really need support from, um, from the government, individuals uh, who feel like um, supporting the cause of art and helping to improve lives. Wonderful. That was a wonderful documentary. I've been seeing some comments in the in the chat. Please keep them coming. The next documentary we'll be watching is Kunle Adewale Futured as Africa's Future Leader by Channels TV, a documentary powered by the United States Department and IREX in the United States. Yeah. Grammarly can help you write quickly and confidently, so you never have to slow down at work. Keep for my dad, love for children, that warmth, that reception, that affection, wanting life to be better for somebody else, I picked that for my dad. So people tend to gravitate towards me and, okay, how are you, how are you doing? And all that, and for you know, someone who is depressed and somebody who is just uh, moody, <laughs> losing up and happy, hey, okay, let's talk about you. And that's it, that, that's something about my dad. Growing up in Lagos State's infamous Mushin slums, Kunle found beauty and solace in a dangerous and impoverished slum. 
let's say maybe around um, eight, ten, thereabouts. I think I had that period of time that I could uh, pick things in the environment and I could bring them together and create something lovely. And I think that in the long run also um, reflects in my struggle as um, a young man. Pablo Picasso said that art washes away the dust of everyday life. Uh, what that translates into is that um, you could, there's enough materials around you to create anything you want to do. So uh, for me as a young child that grew up in an environment like the slum, there are a lot of tailor shops around us. And as a child, you know, see us running around the street and all that, playing around. So while playing around, I was able to find those objects. And while I found those objects, I was able to bring them together and um, use papers, use glue, draw with pencil, cut them with scissors, and start creating them bit by bit by bit by bit until they become a very beautiful picture. And I think that resonates with my life's mission, my life purpose, that I'm born to reach out, picking one life at a time, and bringing meaning to their lives. It's an inspiring story. It's, <laughs> I have to tell you, it's, uh, this one is not for camera, it's an inspiring story. I'm telling you, one can just listen to this story and, and want to weep for joy. It's a beautiful story. After spending many years as a primary school teacher, the U.S. government's Young African Leaders Initiative, YALI, selected Kunle for a six-week course in America, a moment that would change his life. When I was about traveling for YALI program, I actually resigned. I was working as a full-time teacher in the school. I was a primary school teacher. So I told myself, okay, after I return from YALI, my life must not be the same again. I can't go for YALI program and come back and remain on the same spot. And I want to tell you, ever since I resigned, now I'm on my own as a young social entrepreneur. I'm doing better, I'm living better. I have time for my community, I have time for my family, I have time to do whatever I need to do because I realize that YALI has given me so much and I have so much to give back. My wife is very inspirational and instrumental to what I do. And as a matter of fact, when I was traveling to the U.S. for the first time, my first time I was traveling out of the country, I ensured that I did a work of art for her titled My African Queen. The work is there, the art is there. Wow, that's very beautiful. Yeah, I see the gaze, the elegance, wow. the fabrics and everything. Just like, uh, anytime she thinks about me, she can relate with the work I did for her. Through the early program, I've been able to do a lot of um, make a lot of progress and success here in Nigeria. And I remember when I was in the US, I was able to make contact with an international organization called ICEA, uh, who are interested in having program for the internally displaced persons here in Nigeria. And um, through that, I was able to start working with them here in Nigeria, facilitating art therapy for refugees and children, women and young people who are displaced by Boko Haram. Uh, going forward, over 10,000 children and young adults and women have benefited from that healing through art program, thanks to Yali. You realize that I told you I work with children who are survivors of Boko Haram. You can imagine I go to an environment that is not really safe as it were, that is dangerous. Reaching out to children who are marginalized, children who are um, victims of Boko Haram insurgency and trying to see how I can bring out something positive, something beautiful with their life. Growing up in an environment like Mushin, like Islam, and I never imagined that one day I would be able to go to university because I don't see myself going to university because of my challenges and the environment I grew up. But the fact is that art has been able to help me to navigate and make progress in life. Mm. Art has helped me to be able to break barriers and become established in what I do. Art has been able to help me to discover my essence of existence and be able to touch life and change existence. Wonderful.
August 2nd isn't an ordinary day, it is an extraordinary day to celebrate a man making a very good impact in the world. It's a day in which we sit to reflect on the essence of our own very existence. Lastly, on the documentary series is Kule Hadewale, as a young African leader, a documentary by Africa 54, Voice of America, Washington, D.C. for the voiceless. This week on Africa 54, we're highlighting U.S. President Barack Obama's Mandela Washington Fellows Program. For one week at Tulane University in New Orleans, the Yali Fellowship focused on the role of art and civic leadership. We got to spend some time with a Nigerian artist who uses his skills to help build relationships in his home community back in Nigeria. Here is Ola Kunle Adiwale in his own words. My name is Kunle Adewale from Nigeria. I'm studying civic leadership at Tulane University as part of YALI program for 2015. I'm an artist, I'm also an art educator. I teach in schools, teaching kids, and I work in the community with non-government organizations um, through art therapy, art workshops, by engaging the people in the community. So that's part of what I do there in Lagos, Nigeria. I think that art has a relationship um, with building the community because art connects to everything around us. Um, art can be used for activism, art can be used um, for advocacy, and I think that art also connects to politics. Art can be used as a voice for the voiceless. Art can be used as a tool for the airplay. Art can be used for empowerment for the downtrodden. I apply to Yali because I want to be a better leader. And I also know that um, Yali has opportunity of connecting me with people, professionals who are in this field, and who will be able to mentor me and guide me to achieving more with my programs in Nigeria. I have opportunity of um, driving around New Orleans, and for me, it was an awesome moment seeing the mural painting and trying to learn about how the environment is being um, represented in art. I've been able to see how art um, connects to history, how art has been used to immortalize people, how art is used to educate people, how art is used to preserve history. Today we visited Whitney Plantation here in Louisiana. I was disturbed, I was in pain, I was crying because these people had no power to free themselves. Nobody could come to their rescue. They were here, working day and night, and in the process, they lost their lives. And for me, this is um, a moment of um, emotion for me that I can't really, really control. I hope the government will continue to fight anything that promotes slavery in any kind, in but any form. I hope the government will be able to stop it. Ah, this painting is specially for President Barack Obama because he is my hero. Yes, we can. That's the title of the painting. Um, I believe that um, alone we can do little, but together we can accomplish more. So I've been able to um, integrate um, how the United States of America is empowering Africa, a collaboration program to help young leaders in Africa develop their potential to the fullest and see how they can impact their community. Yali informs, Yali transforms, Yali gives you a platform. One for all I can see is passion, dedication, and impact, which is so inspiring, not just to me, but I'm sure to everyone on today's program. Next on our agenda is a keynote address, and this will be taken by Dr. Akin Shete. She is the ever energetic national director and CEO of Sequel Cell Foundation Nigeria. So welcome with me. Dr. Kinshete, as she takes 
the virtual platform. Thank you. Dr. Kinshate will be joining us okay. in a minute. Okay, we have her. <laughs> yes, I'm here. I'm glad to be here. The, the internet has been so unstable here at the National Sickle Cell Center, but I'm really excited. This is a day I've really been looking forward to, to uh, join everyone. It's a privilege, it's an honor. And I'm sorry, I'm not able to show my face and I'd like to, but I'm, I'm told it by my, um, my uh, experts here, they will disturb my, my internet connection even more. So while I have a few minutes, let me just um, go straight to the point. So I'm excited we're, ex we're celebrating today, um, Kunle Adewale Day. I remember I did a voice thing for him during the, I think the first celebration where I did a small promo uh, in honor of uh, Kunle Adewale and to um, um, let everyone know that we're celebrating Kunle Adewale Day. For me, it's like I'm like a proud mother, and uh, because Kule and I have come a very long way. Kule, it was who came to me many years ago, young, uh, straight, uh, to, uh, to start an internship with us at the National Sickle Cell Center, where we work with patients, children especially, who have sickle cell. And as you know, um, as many would know, I don't think everyone knows what sickle cell um, disease or disorder is. Children with sickle cell suffer a lot of pain. The condition is, and the hallmark of this condition is really pain. And as you well know, uh, the, the main symptom, the single symptom that takes patients to see the doctor is pain. But living a life of pain almost every day is it's, it's hard to understand. So it was through uh, Kunle, Kunle's um, ideas, it was, it was always brimming with ideas, he came to me and said, why don't we start something with these children with sickle cell? And so whilst we were waiting to see the doctor, waiting to see, to have procedures done, you know, they would be in the um, waiting room and try their hands out in art, you know, coordinated and facilitated by Kunle and his team. And in a short time, my staff have um, decided to work on the data. How were the patients prior to Kunle's arrival and how are they doing after? How is our program? Um, and before Kunle arrived and started working with us and how has it been after. And, and Kunle, this is still a surprise to you. I will share this with you at some point. So I just want to say uh, that I introduced Kunle Adiwale Day and I'm, I'm still extremely grateful to the mayor of Cincinnati, Mayor John Cranley, who it was that honored our Kunle Adiwale by proclaiming August 2nd as Kunle Adiwale Day. That was as far back as 2019. So here we are celebrating it in 2021. So it's every day, every 2nd of August, every year will be celebrated as Kunle Adewale Day. And I believe this would not just only be in Cincinnati, it would be in all of America, definitely here with us in Nigeria. Looking forward to when I know that Kunle, that future, we, I see you having a national award very, every, um, very soon, I'm sure, by God's grace. Yeah, so this prestigious honor was bestowed on Kunle for his significant contribution and his relentless commitment to the art, practice of arts and medicine, which has benefited several thousands of people, not only in Nigeria, but also in the United States of America and everywhere in the world. This um, engagement today is a, is a testament to the fact that Kunle is bringing people together from across the globe, from everywhere, different parts of Nigeria. I recall at the beginning of this program, it was where well, our moderator was saying, just say where you're uh, uh, chiming in from, what part of the world. And here we are seeing you in Nigeria, US, Egypt, and so on. I saw time everyone together, even though we're, this is um, of, um, August 2nd, um, and honored be stood on you by the mayor of Cincinnati, you are bringing the world together. And uh, it is really kudos to you. And as usual, Kune is always brimming with ideas. And I know that this is a platform this platform that's been given to you, you're going to use it for greater good. And as I say, the reward for hard work is even more work, there's no doubt. And I know that one of the things, some of the things listed out there 
art exhibition, town hall meetings, because you do so much, you know, to engage people. One of the things that really uh, has really excited me with working with Tunde uh, Kunle over the years is he's not, he, you never say never, I'll talk about the uh, Kunle letters shortly, but Kunle it is, it has begun to engage with the government of Nigeria at state level and at national level and even local government levels. And I know that here in Nigeria, that's a model that works for us. When you have public private partnerships, your initiatives tend to do better because of the, you need that political will from government. This sort of thing he had, we, he hosted the first ever um, conference on arts in medicine was here held here in our National Sickle Cell Center. So it, Kune, is, Kune is becoming a household name across the country. And then the various governors of various states would like him to work in their states. And then of course, at national level. And like I said, Kunle, anytime soon. It's a question of recommendation and you will have this definitely deserve it. When I say Kunle, I say K for knowledgeable. There's so many adjectives, but I look at, think of some words when I see uh, Kunle and I say K, I think of knowledgeable. You, you are unstoppable. N, never say never. He never says never. L, we are a leader. You're a leader and you nurture younger ones to becoming leaders. E is for your energy, very energetic. It's, it's, it's infectious and his enthusiasm for life and for work is infectious. And I know, I'm just um, really in awe of the things that you do. I, I cherish you. And like I said, I'm a proud mother, really, when I think of you. And I know that you're going to use this platform for greater good. I'm so glad that everyone has come together at this um, table, as it were, to celebrate you. So Kunle on uh, kudos, and the honor is just the beginning. You're going to the beginning of many more to come by the grace of God. So I wish everyone a wonderful deliberation today. That was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Akinshete, for that welcome address. And now we'll be enjoying a music performance by Jeremy. Hello everyone, welcome to the Kunle Adewali Day 2021. My Day 2021. My name is Chiremi and this is We Are Here by Alicia Keys. Enjoy. <laughs> Bums of a bandit, trying to get something we never had. Let's start with a good dad. So real, but it's so sad. While we're burning this incense, we're gonna pray for the innocent. Cause right now we don't make sense. Right now we don't make sense. Let's talk about Shatow. Let's talk about Gaza. Let's talk about, let's talk about Israel. Cause right now it is. Real. Let's talk about, let's talk Nigeria In a mass hysteria Here our souls are brought together So that we can love each other Sister, we are here We are here for all of us We are here for all of us That's why we are here we are here, we are here, oh, 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 Why we are 
Wow, that was a wonderful rendition. Before we move to the keynote address by Dr. Yewen Day, we would like some people to join us on stage and tell us in one minute about Kunle Adewale. Who is Kunle Adewale to you? What does the word Kunle Adewale mean to you? What impact has it made in your life or in your country over the years? So we would like people from different parts of the world to join us on stage. Just um, raise your hand and we would call on you. We would like to get this interesting part of the session started. Oh, I can okay. see your hand, yeah. Okay, so um, we would start with Oluwa Emmanuel. Please go ahead, Emmanuel. Hello. Hello. Hi, Emmanuel. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Good afternoon. All right, so Mr. Kunle Adwale, I got to know him through one Mr. Sheidara. As a young artist that I am, so um, for me, Mr. Mr. Kunle Adwale is currently living the kind of life I wish to live as an artist. One of the things that is quite inspiring for me is the fact that after he had finished his education, he asked the question that what was it going to do specially? What was, what was going to distinct him? And finally, he, he, his act currently is, it's just like, he's just like a mentor to me. Like some, most of the things he's doing is what I'm doing currently on a grassroots level. So it's, it's very nice to, to to, to have heard about Mr. Kunle Adewale, and I'm encouraged that what I'm doing as an artist is not, you know, when you are doing something you think is, uh, it's not what everyone in your community is doing. You look so different, but when you see someone like him and he has now taken it to a peak, right? Um, I I think we lost Emmanuel for a minute. Um, we would be moving over to the keynote address by Dr. Yewende. So um, over to you, Franca, for the introduction of Dr. Yewende. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. You've been doing an incredible job. Today, I have the majestic honor of introducing our keynote speaker. This lady, this woman embodies the word social change and social impact, just like the man we are celebrating today. She has so many laurels to her name. She's recognized as an artist, activist, and ambassador. She's recognized as a leader in innovative strategic leadership, diversity and inclusion, social impact, and international development. Dr. Yewande Austin, has and her work has reached over 250,000 people in 30 countries, including 23 countries across the continent of Africa. She was recently crowned as a chief of the Obosi Kingdom in Anambra State, Nigeria, for her dedication to the African diaspora. Conferred with an honorary doctorate in humanitarianism from Stanford University, United Kingdom for international development work. Dr. Austin is also recognized as a 2017 President Barack Obama Lifetime Achievement Award honoree. 2020 
American Heart Association Go Red for Women ambassador and 2020 CNBC Rising Women, one of 35 women changing the future of Africa. It is my delight to be introducing her to have the virtual lecture as she takes us through the theme, the arts for cultural diplomacy. The art for cultural diplomacy, Dr. Yewende Austin. Over to you, Ma. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings from the United States. I'm having a little bit of a technical issue over here. I can't share my screen. If anybody could enable me as a co-host, that would be great. So I think it's not giving me the option of giving, making you a course. And I'm wondering why that is happening. Uh, let me see. Whoa, amazing. Um, Franca, can you do that from your end? Um, I believe the co, if I'm not mistaken, is Mr. Data as the host. I should be the host. It shouldn't be the host. So I don't know why. That's what um, I... She could just know. make her co-host. I think it's Mr. Detayo. I can see it from here. Okay, now your host. All right, all right. All right, good. Thank you very much. I think. All right. Sorry about that. It's okay. We we're all creatives on this line, so we we know we have to innovate sometimes and and shift. Okay, I just see a sign now. It says, "I am a co-host." Give me just one moment. Okay, can everybody see my screen? We can give it a little thumbs up. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much again uh, for having me to share this important message with you all today. Um, Kunle and the work that he is doing that you all are all a part of right now is so important, I think, during this global pandemic more than ever. Human crisis has always revealed inequities that exist within our humanity, but it also shows our resilience. And I think that we're learning during this pandemic that innovation is one of the key platforms that is helping us pivot, not only to survive this pandemic, but to thrive. I think we've learned how to listen better, how to learn differently, how to teach more creatively, how to solve some of the simplest problems that before the pandemic, perhaps we took for granted, but now we understand and we're witnessing that creativity is at the heart of everything that is helping us to thrive during an unprecedented time in our world. You know, one of the greatest inspirations in my life has certainly been Harriet Tubman. She once said that every great dream begins with a dreamer. Now, most people know of Harriet Tubman as an enslaved African-American in the state of Maryland in the United States. She was born into slavery, both of her parents from the continent of Africa. And in the 1800s, Harriet Tubman was expected to be nothing more than a slave. Now we know the story. She went on to free thousands of enslaved Africans at the height of the transatlantic slave trade, but Harriet Tubman was much more than an abolitionist. She was an agriculturalist. She knew how to identify the right vegetation as she freed slaves from the south to the north to their freedom. She knew how to avoid the berries that were poisonous. She was an ecologist, which meant that she had to know the land which she escaped through. She had to know um, the areas that were safe. 
those that were maybe dangerous because European slave owners were afraid to travel, for instance, through the swamplands because they were filled with alligators and crocodiles and snakes, but she knew the exact path that she needed to take because she was intimately familiar with the land which she used to escape. She was also an astronomer because she needed to know how to look at the stars and follow the constellations that would lead her from the south to the north. But very few people look at Harriet Tubman as a creative. She was. Creatives look at all of the infinite possibilities that other people see as impossible. She saw what was possible through the resources that she had not only to free herself, not only to ensure that she had an education in a country that didn't feel like she was worthy of an education, that she was only a piece of property meant to serve them, she had to see what was possible out of the impossible. Harriet Tubman was an innovator. And so Harriet Tubman taught me at a very early age, not only how to dream, but how to use my creative sensibilities to make those dreams come true. You see, as a little girl, I was like one of millions of girls around the world that experienced early trauma. My mom saw me struggling, but she taught me two lessons that would forever change the way I looked at myself in the world. She taught me one, that I didn't have to be defined by my circumstances, and two, I could become better because of what I had overcome. Little did I know those were two principles of someone who thinks creatively, not to be bound by your circumstances, but look at all of the infinite possibilities that exist outside of those circumstances. Those two lessons served as the ethos of work that I have conducted using creativity as the hub of everything that I do to transform communities internationally. It taught me how standing for the rights of others as I'm here 11 years old, marching against uh, apartheid in front of the South African embassy. It taught me that working with AIDS orphans in Malawi, this was really the beginning of my journey working in Africa in 2006, <clears throat> excuse me, that children whose schools I walked into, who at first looked vacant and sad, that when I leaned in, that I would sing a, a funga lafia, ashe, ashe, funga lafia, ashe, ashe. They taught me that leaning in through music and the arts, as we're here to discuss, was a creative way that broke another boundary, language. It also broke yet another boundary, that's economic uh, development and status that it didn't matter what class you were born into, that music helps us feel, it helps us connect. And music helped me to continue to open up a gateway to teaching the most vulnerable children in the world critical information they needed to thrive. It taught me how to teach um, child soldiers in the Democratic Republic of the Congo how to express their dreams and, and children right there in, in Lagos how to use all of the challenges that they had overcome as to use the skills, I'm sorry, that they had crafted with the challenges they had overcome to build businesses. It taught me how to connect with children around the world. This led me to winning a Lifetime Achievement Award um, presented by President Barack Obama. Music truly taught me everything. It taught me to be fearless. It taught me how to connect. It taught me during a time when we thought that social activism was no longer necessary with the election of President Obama, that it was still important to fight for the rights of others around the world. It taught me just like the pandemic has taught all of us that we can no longer afford to subscribe to an idea that a, a problem is someone else's, but it's ours to solve together. In less than 30 days, the coronavirus spread from China to the entire world. 
it shut the entire world down for a moment. But we realize that of the many things that we have in common, we have the ability to pivot and we can do so creatively, not only to address simple, but very complex problems that can leave us perhaps better off than where we started. So you're probably wondering why so many of us are passionate about the arts as tools for uh, diplomacy, as tools for addressing social and economic inequities. And that's because human performance is driven by our ability to be creative. If some of you were convinced that your IQ or your intellectual quotient was the most important, meaning how smart you were, then unfortunately you have been fed a lie. Science actually recognizes that our intellectual quotient only accounts for 15% of the skills that we need to solve problems. But look at this diagram. Here you see that creative thought comprises 43% of our ability to pivot as we're recognizing right now during the pandemic and create sustainable solutions. And our EQ or our emotional quotient is 42%. So how do they go hand in hand? When you hear a song like Funga Lafia or um, And I am telling you I'm not going Cause you're the best country I've ever known There's no way I could ever go Nigeria, there's no way no, 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 I, I'm living without you. It's because when we're creative, our creative expression has the ability to tap into what? Our emotions. And if you, my friends, can use your creative abilities to tap into someone's emotions, then you have opened up a gateway to infinite possibilities. And so through this understanding, I created a methodology that I call creative socioeconomic transformation. The process of synthesizing innovative solutions to social and economic challenges through creative strategies. Yes, just like Harriet Tubman, and just like so many of you who have had to learn how to pivot to find the possibilities that exist within the impossible new world that we have been thrust into, your creative sensibilities help you solve everyday problems. I use creative thinking to empower vulnerable children in spaces of education, secure housing, food security, healthcare, teaching job skills, teaching vulnerable communities how to be economically sustainable. Oh, um, uh oh, can you hear me? Okay, through creative thinking. Now there are three C's of leadership that I teach. And when we talk about creativity, we have to talk about leadership. The ability to see what's possible in the impossible requires leadership skills but you may be surprised to know that the World Economic Forum says that creativity is the single most important skill needed to solve the world's greatest challenges. So what are those three C's? Starting with compassion. When we talk about compassion, we're talking about addressing social and emotional impact, having compassion for others, as I, I said earlier, that we can no longer subscribe to an idea that a problem is someone else's, but we must um, lean in to the challenges that other people experience. We must tap into our heart and understanding that if we identify and can master our emotions, we can use that emotional understanding to solve the biggest social problems that exist in society. The next C is content. What are your deliverables? So often we are focused on 
traditional de deliverables, especially in the world of humanitarian aid. We focus just on agricultural development or just on education, um, maybe just on business, which I'm gonna get around to talking about in just a moment. But how many of you are challenging yourselves in the way that you deliver that content, whatever topic you choose to use to solve everyday problems? We must get creative in the way that we deliver this content. We can do it through visual arts, through poetry, dance, through rap and music. And next is creativity. The most important leadership skill that you have is creativity. We must innovate beyond some of the trad traditional ways that we understand how to solve problems, but it's up to you to deliver them. So I thought it would be helpful to take you through a case study of how I have used CSET, uh, Creative Socio-Emotional Transformation, to solve one of the biggest challenges that I have in my career, and that is creating a sustainable rehabilitation community for Boko Haram conflict survivors in Nigeria. So in 2015, my organization, the Change Rocks Foundation, then uh, known today as Change International, was the first in the world to provide emergency education relief to Boko Haram conflict survivors in um, Abuja, Nigeria, in the Durumi camp. When I got there, um, I saw that there were hundreds of children that didn't have access to formal education. And while I was told that I was going to work with an older uh, population of teens, I found out very quickly that there were little children that were in dire need of structure. They were in need of understanding not only their one, two, threes and their ABCs, but how to use this core academic content that we very often take advantage of and learn how to integrate that into problems that I felt that they needed to be equipped to learn. Here you see me teaching them a lesson in leadership. What I didn't understand is that through a creative process um, that I would come to develop one of the very first rehabilitation communities in Nigeria that would provide uh, conflict survivors with a bevy of, of critical resources that they need to create change. Here's some of the challenges that I'm facing. Unfortunately, there are over 15 million children worldwide that are forced into child labor. Many of those children are across Nigeria, forced to beg for money and food, making them, however, more vulnerable to human trafficking. Unfortunately, 40% of children are at risk of becoming human trafficking victims in Nigeria. And 80% of Nigerian girls that are trafficked are trafficked as far away as America and Europe for commercial sexual exploitation. The statistics are staggering, but there is a solution. And I want you to just take a little peek into how I'm using a creative approach to empowering vulnerable children in Nigeria and around the world. If you can give me a thumbs up if you hear the audio, please, just to confirm. I can't save you. But I'm going to teach you how to save yourself. any camp and I wish and I pray and I beg that this can be replicated and this can only be replicated if somebody or some people or some group have the funds to help people like you when they with such a beautiful heart like her she left her comfort zone and came here to be with us in our mess 
And why did you leave? Don't be cook a barbosa. Boko Haram. Said Boko Haram chased them from their homes. Families have identified the girls as some of the more than 200 students kidnapped from Chibok, if you remember, two years ago. Okay, so can we look inside? So how many people live in here? There are eight. This is a business run by all of these women, IDPs, that escaped Boko Haram but had not given up. Two months ago I started teaching them social entrepreneurship online and this is the result of that concept. Teaching these women how to take the skills and talents that they do have and create a business that could impact change in their communities. You will have to know why your product is better than anybody else's product. What's another reason? Quick. Another reason. Cost effective? What else? Please assist you and then assist us as well. Because she can't do it alone, you know. She can't do it alone. I've personally funded this work with refugees and trafficking victims for almost three years. But now I need your help to build this transformational rehabilitation model. This is a humanitarian crisis that affects all of us. Did you know that more than 200,000 victims are trafficked from Nigeria to America and Europe? Your donation will help me protect, educate, and shelter refugee children. Raise awareness about global human trafficking in my documentary, Amazing Grace Freedom Song, and give these families a chance to change the world. I wish someone could hear me, but they only turn. Sorry, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. So I would love for you to now join me in the chat and share some of the observations that you made in the video. Did you recognize some of the ways that I use creative expression, creative thinking as ways to engage um, the participants that I work with? Any ideas, observations? Uh-oh. Okay, creative expression was great. Defining leadership roles and allowing children to participate. Yes, very important. 
using the arts and entrepreneurship, identifying a problem, securing a safe place, long-term plan that's sustainable. You like the first thing I said. I don't know what I said. Adeboye, what did I say? I look at there. Oh, they were looking up to me. Ah, ah, okay, yes. The first thing that I said in the video was, I'm not here to save you. I'm, I'm here to teach you how to save yourself, right? That's a very important concept that I teach in vulnerable communities internationally because, you know, humanitarian aid has also created inequities around the world. And that is this thought that people who live in poverty should depend on other people to save them. No, I'm teaching the people that I work with the creative skills that they need, right? Think creatively about how to solve the problem yourself. Because when we empower vulnerable communities with the skills that they need, what's happening? Does anybody know? They feel joy, right? When you feel more joy, that means that you are stimulating more endorphins that do what? Combat chronic illnesses like depression, right? Um, chronic physical pain. It also helps to do what? Develop neurons. Kunle knows that. The more that you engage someone in thinking critically, develops and stimulates the growth of more neurons, which helps the people that I serve to function better, more, uh, more efficiently, independently. I now have taught Boko Haram IDPs that I work with, they're helping me build the village. I don't have a massive team in Nigeria to do that. I've been teaching them leadership skills. And through that process, we are now getting ready to break ground on the village and they are leading they will do the building. I have given them the skills, I'm giving them the framework and they will do the work, which will then do what? Create more ownership, which will then do something else. Teach other people how to do the very same thing that they're doing. So creative thinking, you see, here we see great message, connecting to the people the way that matter most, teaching the people creative entrepreneurship strategies like unique points, nurturing their creative ideas. Other, other great contributions here to the conversation, right? Because many of the Boko Haram conflict survivors I first worked with said, oh no, we can't make that because we're not good, right? We come from Borno, we're not very creative until I taught them how to think more creatively. Can you teach somebody? Okay, thank you, Franca. Can you teach somebody to be creative? You can, and I'm gonna get into showing you some of that. So here are some of the points um, uh, that, that I recognize certainly uh, in the video. The delivery methods that, that I use were different. Um, witnessing their emotional response, their physical response, right? When the children felt more joyful, they moved differently, they behaved differently, they started making different choices. The economic impact and learning outcomes are always um, that I was able to generate results through a creative framework. Our sustainable model looks something like this. To the very upper left-hand corner you see, um, we have displaced families that we will provide secure housing for. Um, then they will receive uh, both medical care and psychosocial support, job training and education. Uh, we will um, develop a farm there to manufacture and process the food and distribute that so that it is sustainable. Have a lodge on the premises so that professionals can come and observe and teach. And then before we resettle our families into local communities, we will provide them with micro loans because social entrepreneurship will be a very important part of the training that we provide them and then bring in the next family within uh, one year. I'm gonna keep going through here because we're quickly coming to an end because I could talk about this all day long. Um, but I, I wanted to show how, again, creative thinking is helping in an area that I call economic inclusion, ensuring that vulnerable communities are included within the economy. All too often, vulnerable people are excluded from the economy. We think because they haven't had access to formal education that they don't have anything to contribute and it's just the opposite. When I first started this program, I started by teaching the women social entrepreneurship, how to build their own business. They learned how to build business plans. 
Um, I paid for them to take sewing lessons and we made reusable sanitary napkins and they turned this into making spices. Then I taught them marketing and they developed a poultry farm and they've learned how to farm with ginger and released Freedom Pads, the very first reusable sanitary napkins um, manufactured by and distributed by IDP women in Nigeria. I thought we were really doing something amazing until we hit the pandemic and they leaned on the skills that they were taught and they did something magnificent. They turned the four businesses that I invested into into 10 businesses. Yeah, Alheri Turawen Wuta, right? Um, incense, liquid soap, shampoo, chili peppers. And now they have the Women of Alheri Empowerment Group where they are empowering over 100 other women how to do what they do. The impact of teaching people how to think creatively, how to solve everyday problems is endless. It helps to increase the GDP, reduces crime, reduces rape, abuse, and human trafficking, which is the point of the community that I'm developing, improves health. Um, too many of the women that I've served there, unfortunately, have given birth to stillborn um, babies. Sadly, some of the girls that I've worked with have been forced into early marriages, but we're reducing the uh, cases by empowering the women and children. We're increasing workforce development, but most importantly, social stability. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna have to wrap up here in just a moment, but for anybody who thought that connecting the arts to social change um, is a far reach. I want to challenge you that when we think about an artistic skill like singing, we're teaching people how to communicate better. When we teach something like conducting, we're teaching people how to be leaders. Drawing teaches problem solving, how to create something out of nothing. Poetry teaches empathy, how to use the uh, ability we have to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else to feel their pain to feel the fears that they do living in abject poverty, but also to know what it's like to have a dream, a dream that is possible if we think through creative means. And so we won't have time for um, some of these other pieces, but I do wanna leave you here with my create framework. Maybe you can take a snapshot of this and try uh, practice putting this into action in your own time. When we talk about creativity, we're talking about uh, starting with capitalizing, identifying creative skills that can be used to achieve sustainable change, resiliency, creating multiple solutions that promote resilience from the inside out, empowerment, addressing the interrelated causes of the problem from simple to complex issues, Assessing, this is so important. When we confront issues that seem like they're impossible to solve, we start with the first step of assessing both community needs and design solutions that are required to achieve um, sustainable change. Next, we have to focus on transforming, developing a plan that doesn't just fix a problem, but transforms the entire process. This is my goal with Alheri Village, not to create just another IDP camp or a refugee camp, but to change the way we value and manage and empower vulnerable communities. And last, I think is the most difficult step when it comes to using creative thinking to solve problems, that's executing. Executing the most effective solution for the issue that you have identified. Because there are many ways that we can solve these problems. And it's easy for you to think about everything that will go wrong in solving the problems it's a bigger challenge for you to think about the infinite possibilities that exist within your creative ideas and solutions that can change the world. Thank you so much, Kunle. Um, I'm honored to be a part of your celebration today and I'm open for questions if we still have time and can't wait to see what you all do with some of these ideas and thinking differently about how we use creative thinking um, to change the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Austin. That was indeed a powerful session. 
we we don't really have time but i would have loved to get one question from the audience i don't know if anyone has a question we can just take one one question you can put in the chat box or raise up your hand so i know that you were there or are we still awestruck <laughs> it's most likely we're awestruck it was very easy to understand easy to follow and you're an amazing teacher thank you for being here today what stood out for me most from your presentation were your two lessons from your mother which mm. is one I do not need to be defined by my circumstances. And secondly, I can definitely become better. It's something I will definitely be reflecting on from today henceforth. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Austin. I see nobody else has. I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, I'm going oh, to ask sure. a question. Yeah, definitely. First and foremost, I want to thank uh, Dr. Yuan Austin uh, for making it today. I know um, for almost like about five years now, we've been trying as much as possible to connect. And it's been a bit um, challenging. Either you're flying into Nigeria and I'm flying to the US, and then you're flying back to the US and I'm flying back to Nigeria. So, missing an answer, but I know definitely the universe will find a way of ensuring that we meet in person. But most importantly, um, it gladdens my heart. Uh, and I'm inspired by the, inc the incredible works that you're doing. Earlier on, before you gave your keynote speech, um, and there were several media documentaries which spotlight some of the engagement I have been having on this side of the world. I work in the vulnerable population. And they, as you were sharing, and uh, I was all smiling. And I like, I, I try to imagine you being an African American mm. and how our work in a way intersects. Because I mean, there are several hundreds of thousands of African Americans. And but then you choose to embrace your journey. You choose to embrace your purpose. You choose to explore the potential that God has given to you. And I, as I question, as I reflect on what it is for you uh, being an African-American and coming to the continent of Africa, coming to Nigeria specifically, yeah. and going to the war-torn area and you trying to bring change into that community, looking at the concept of art, for cultural diplomacy, you knowing fully way that okay, Americans have their own lifestyles, and Africans have their own uh, lifestyles. So, what? How would you say you were able to to do that? So, I, I think that your the first part of your question is why would I, perhaps as an African American, take my time to come to Africa, right? Um, and I'm asked that a lot. Uh, I have lived a very blessed life, Kunle. Um, I have certainly had a lot of challenges in my life, but my challenges don't compare to so many people that I serve around the world. And um, the very first time that I came to Africa and I saw that I was not just teaching children, but I saw the response to those children. It was such a visceral, deep and powerful response. I thought, if I'm gonna do this work for the rest of my life the way I dreamed of doing it, I wanna work with communities that aren't taking advantage, taking for granted rather what it is that I do, but they're taking advantage of it. I saw these children one trip after the other, after the other across the continent, who were not sitting still anymore, they were putting into action everything that I taught them. Um, and so while I love doing this work in the United States as well, I must say that there is a very different mindset on the continent. Yeah, Karen, you're agreeing. There's a different mindset that says, give me what I need to be the change I want to see. Somehow we have still not, <clears throat> excuse me, recovered from slavery in the United States. You see here now 400 years later, even in the midst of abject poverty that such a large percentage of Africa still struggles with, there is something about awareness of self, of culture, of tribe, pride in who you are. Uh oh, okay, pride in who you are that changes the demographic of the people that I work with. Um, you saw for in, in um, Abuja, for instance, I funded four businesses, that's it. 
I funded more than that, you understand. I funded staff and travel and food and education and things of that nature. But in terms of the businesses, after I taught those women how to build business from the ground up, four, they turned it into 10. Those 10, they turned into an, an entire empowerment organization. I didn't teach them how to do that. I didn't tell them to do that. They knew that knowledge is power. We have to spread this to other places. And so, you know, I would challenge anybody who works in these spaces to not only not be inspired, be, but be compelled to do what you can do for people who are doing the work. Um, that's the simplest way that I can explain it to you. Um, the deeper explanation is that I am African. Um, so I have through my DNA analysis discovered that I'm over 30% Nigerian uh, and my ancestors are from the Congo and from Mali. And while I have been mixed with European blood, my heart is in Africa. So I'm still waiting for some of my African-American peers to catch up and understanding that we are all African. Um, the very first remnants of the first woman to ever inhabit the earth was in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I feel much, uh, much like um, the message that I've tried to convey about a mindset that we must change in this pandemic is that I don't see Africa as something special I'm doing over there. I think that my brothers and sisters on the continent are still my brothers and sisters. I just happen to work with a lot of people um, on another continent that are still my brothers and sisters and who are depending on me to teach them how to disrupt poverty and write the next chapter in their lives. So I won't go on and on. Thank you so much though, Kunle. This has been amazing. And um, I, uh, we will meet again one day. Absolutely. I, I, I love what you said uh, about like empowering the communities. I know there are several stereotypes that, you know, for some people when they come to Africa, it's more of spotlighting poverty, what is not working you know the media always tell us what is not going right in africa sure and so rather than amplifying what is good what is great are the potentials mm -hmm. rather it's the other way around so but i love what you're doing in terms of how you plug yourself in into the community and most importantly how little thing can become big change i mean mm -hmm. you mentioned certain things that apart from like giving them the tools and the toolkit and the knowledge, mm -hmm. they have to run, they have to improvise, they have to amplify. And the ripple effect is some of the things that you have highlighted today. And I want to commend you for that incredible and very powerful change that you bring it to Nigeria. Thanks so much, Dr. Yoande. Um, I, it's my deepest honor, Kunle. And I actually have a request from you for Alheri Village, but I'll wait until Kunle Adewale Day has come to an end because I have something that I need you to help me with to help to bring this all, all together. Um, I think we just have to continue to do the work and we have to. I'm so, I'm so proud of you for elevating the way that we must creatively think about how we change these problems. And I'm buying land by the end of the week and we start the building of the village. So more creativity to be done. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. No amount of thank you would ever be enough <laughs> to say to you. With that, we'll actually come to the end of the first session of Kunde Adewale Day. Is Esther still on the call? Well, I can see her in the chat box. <laughs> I can see her in the chat box. I've had a fantastic time. I have learned so much. I have been charged to go out <laughs> and be a dreamer. <laughs> I can just say wow Franka wow 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 like I need uh -huh. to sit down we examine my life first is how to be an impact maker how to have a name named after me either in the US <laughs> or whatever and number two how to build another village like Dr. Yewandi Austin you know how to make an impact in the world thinking outside of your own self like how can I use my gift to impact the world 
positively. That was wonderful, Franca. That, that really was. And just to answer the question of how can you have a, na a day named after you, I think I realized the hack when Mr. Kune put it in the chat box or someone put it in the chat box. The way you offer value, everything else would follow. So I think that is really the core message today, that yeah. offer your value and everything else would follow. So that we don't eat in too much into the next session, which begins, supposed to have begun by 3.15, but I believe we'll be beginning by 3.30. I want you all to hold on because it's not over yet. We have a power pack day for you all. And the next session will be anchored by the very lovely Onye, who is on this call as well. If you enjoyed this session, you definitely want to stay for the next. All right. I can see the music Around without stopping. My name is Simidele, and I'll be singing for you today. Um, this is a song that I wrote. It doesn't have a title yet, but. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to this thing called life Don't you let it pass you by Oh, we've been waiting for the day you'd arise They say the journey of a thousand miles Begins when you take a stride So take a leap on this road of possibilities Be brave, go chase After all your dreams Be bold, now roll Against the stream now time can you see it keep hope alive and believe that you're the one we've been waiting for look up at the stars you will see that the future is bright oh believe that you're the one we've been waiting for Show us what you've got in store Hello, welcome to a brand new day Don't worry, it is not too late Shake off the dust, don't let the sun go to waste
Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Are you all hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Onyinye Uba. I'm a storyteller. Yeah, people can say writer, but I prefer to be called a storyteller. And I will be the one anchoring the next session, which is building uh, bridges through the arts. You know, first of all, I want to really thank um, Esther and Franca. And then also want to uh, um, thank um, Dr. Austin. She really did a good job. I, I wasn't really expecting this, <laughs> really. I wasn't really expecting something this great. She blew my mind, she blew me away. And uh, it, it, it's a, a very good one. So uh, here in the next session, uh, we'll be talking about building bridges through the arts. And I will be uh, having, um, I'll be joined by, uh, a pan, uh, sorry, can you hear me? My network is acting up. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, that's fine. Sorry, my network is acting up for me too. Okay, so I'll be joined by uh, three wonderful people uh, with a very rich profile. And I mean, you know, one of those when I when I was told I was going to anchor this session, I had to, you know, look up the profile of these people, and I was blown away. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce, uh, make a little introduction about Annie Ruth. Now, Annie Ruth is the president and CEO of the Eye of the Eye of the Arts. Uh, she's an award-winning an internationally respected visual artist, poet, and author with over 40 years experience in her field. 40 years, that's like some years before I was even born. And she creates a work that celebrates the human spirit and travels to venues across the globe, using her gifts to reach audiences from all walks of life. She has a passion for mobilizing the community and promoting reading and promoting reading and literacy. And uh, Annie Ruth is best described as a renaissance woman and a catalyst for community engagement. Also uh, here in, in our panel, we also have uh, Bakare Mubarak. Bakare Mubarak is the tallest model in the sub-Saharan Africa as are judged by the modeling scouts and practitioners. You know, that has been a record that he has held since 2016. I guess when he joins us, he will tell us the exact height. I'll be very interested in that. And uh, he's the co-founder of X54 Limited. And uh, he is also the ambassador of business learning, culture and education for CIS, RCCC, RGCC, pardon. I beg your pardon. And also uh, we have Dr. Manale Elewa. I hope I pronounced that well. <laughs> okay, Dr. Manale Elewa is the founder of Art to Care Egypt and board member of uh, Global Arts in Medicine Fellowship. Um, uh, um, Arts in Medicine Fellowship is an international non-project non -pro non program with the goal to support and strengthen the power of artistic participation in elevating individual pain and improving health and psychological outcome for the patients, family and caregivers. And uh, she studied therapy counseling at uh, Dublin Art Therapy. And uh, she also studied um, environmental engineering at the University of Washington. So, um, Sorry. One minute. So obviously I, I, I have a very, very powerful people here to join me. So uh, let me start with you, Miss Annie Ruth. Apart from yes, I have read your profile, very rich, but I also want like, to ask you a simple question. Mm -hmm. Who is Annie Ruth? I want you to answer that. You know, I, I have read your profile, you know, but I want you to tell us something extraordinary about you 
that the world has recognized. Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, Annie, Annie Ruth is a beautiful sister who is a child of the Most High, who I, I realized that my gift uh, was poured into me to pour into the world. And so I am, when it comes to just the art forms that I use, I consider myself to be a, a reservoir or a, a toolbox of really building bridges and bringing people together. So that, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, you get, you get mother, daughter, grandmother, and all of that tied in, in there. Uh, you also get basketball player <laughs> and gardener, all, all many things, but ultimately just a beautiful child of the most high who knows that my gift has been given to me to share with the world. All right, that was great. Um, Mubarak, are you there? Hello? It's, it's okay. Hello. Good afternoon. So, Bakari, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm so elated to be here. I am, you know, I, I can't find words because I am, I am so, so um, happy to actually be a part of this uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, observance. And I, I, I deliberately, uh, you know, I deliberately came here with this wonderful African uh, art, basically, okay. you know, uh, as a cultural ambassador, I would like you guys to permit me to talk about this, because for me, this is also one of the highlights, you know, uh, based on the fact that we are also talking about culture, uh, arts for cultural diplomacy. You know, uh, this cup is regarded as Fila Gobi. It's actually originated from the southwestern part of Nigeria. And uh, this cup has a very fantastic marital significance. You know, when I wear my cup and I bend it to the right, it means I am not married. And I, when I wear it and turn it the other way around, this way, it means I'm married, you know. So back in the days, uh, our predecessors actually wear this cup, you know, instead of wearing rings. And I think, um, you know, we should always try as much as possible uh, and endeavor to go back to our roots, you know, um, represent Africa everywhere we go across the world. Uh, thank uh -oh. you so much for once again. Okay, uh, I see that. So what, while we wait for him. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you for that, uh, that, <laughs> that introduction. I like the calf and I like the way it's planted that, that means obviously you're not married. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, uh, Doctor Ma Ma Malane Manale has Manale. <laughs> Okay, um, can you say? Uh, yes, we have read your profile, but can you tell us what's special about Doctor Manale that everyone would like to hear? What do you think that is special to you? That you know, how do? You, what do you think is special to you that the world has recognized? Uh, that's a nice question. Uh, I think we all understand that uh, the world could be seen uh, through the eyes of artists. And that's why the artists help us to, to do and uh, to show like a story telling. So I'll tell you one uh, nice story. We all know um, 1001 uh, Nights, which comes from the old, 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 old history. We all know about Shahrazad. And guess what about Shahrazad? She was the first creative arts therapist in the world. And why is that? Because she lived by helping the king deal with his unconscious, unresolved anger, and sublimate his Oedipal, his Oedipal processes by telling him fairy tales. Then by falling in love with him, and he fell in love with her and did not kill her. He used to kill every other woman. They lived happily ever after. The story of the first art therapist in the world, in the history. So this inspired me a lot. 
coming back to Egypt, the land of the pharaohs, my country in Africa, as you all are from Africa. So I wanted to bring art therapy for the children in need, the children suffering from life-threatening disease, cancer patients, and special needs. It was not academically in the country. And still, we are struggling to have a program such as the, the fellowship you just mentioned earlier. This is one of the outstanding programs that is coming to Egypt, to Africa, help all people in need. This is me. I was in need as those people one day. And I was in such a deep need for someone like Conley to offer me a hand. That's what's special for me. I met Conley. I met him virtually on Instagram. Still, we will meet one day, but we have so much similarities together. So okay. much. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, before, yeah, okay, so I have this question for Annie Ruth, first of all. Um, you know, as an artist, how have you been using the arts to uh, build bridges in your practice and across cultural barriers? Oh my goodness, you know, uh, amazingly enough, one of the things I think that, that we as, as Black people or African Americans uh, have had to endure is always to use that um, our art form as a cultural bridge. I mean, recently in the in the United States, and you've probably uh, heard it uh, on the news with just the murder of George Floyd, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, and many things that have been going on. I recently created an art exhibit called "On Her Shoulders" to use the art as a a springboard for conversations between. Um, uh, different races, and, and specifically to dive into the, the viewpoint of a Black woman. Um, I love the art form is because art is actually the most non-threatening way to communicate with others. Sometimes you can get some of the most um, controversial topics and most sensitive topics addressed through a song, through a painting, through a, a poem, and that's the way that we began to build those bridges by beginning to build those relationships, finding the things that we have in common and branching from there. Okay, okay, thank you very much for that. So uh, before we continue, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Deputy Public Affairs Officer, U.S. Consulate Nigeria. Her name is, her name is Jennifer Ford. Uh, she's a representative of the U.S. mission to Nigeria. You're welcome, Ma. Thank you for joining us here. Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you, Anne Ruth. I, I appreciate that. So um, over to you, uh, Mubarak. Being a model from first of all, I, I said before I continue. You know, what's your exact height? Uh, <laughs> so I am only six nine actually, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So basically, in 2016, when I was 20, uh, I was about 6'9", they're about 6'8", I beg your pardon, you know, and at the time, uh, I was about the same height as the tallest professional model in the world, and at the time, the record uh, older was um, Evelyn Eve, you know, and um, that was how, the, uh, you know, I had a lot of publications on the media, you know, the press always come to have interviews with me, and you know, ask me several questions and what have you. You know, over the years, okay. I actually be taller, you know, and I okay. tend to coincide. Go ahead, please. Okay, sorry, to, sorry. To just, I just wanted to ask you, like, you know, so as a model, being quite tall and as a model, you know, so how have you been using, you know, ads? How have you been using your ads to build bridges in your practice across uh, cultural barriers? Because I know, you, of course, you are well traveled. So, how have you been using the arts to build bridges? Right. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, for me, you know, I often say this uh, in recent times that uh, for me, modeling is not the ultimate, 
Uh, rather, it is a deployment strategy to position myself uh, for global opportunities and then to leverage and need to be able to, uh, to preach my message of peace, unity, and solidarity amongst African uh, who are on the continent, you know, I mean, continental Africans and Africans in the diaspora and then the world at large, basically. So it has, like I said, it has been a deployment strategy for me. And um, over the years, uh, I have been able to uh, leverage on that as well to promote the African culture, you know, whilst incorporating art, uh, tourism, uh, fashion, you know, lifestyle, and most of all, to be able to uh, preach and preach my message of unity, solidarity, uh, and oneness amongst continental Africans and Africans in the diaspora. And um, in recent time, I've just uh, been bestowed the honor to be the ambassador of business lasting uh, culture and education to the sixth region global chamber of commerce. You know, and that by virtue of that, I have also been able to create my own uh, uh, incorporation, my own company uh, that, that actually uh, targets fostering business communications between African diaspora and continental Africans, you know, and the world at large. So uh, in a nutshell, I think my natural endowment has been, you know, uh, would I call it a blessing in disguise? Because I've been able to leverage on that to, uh, to do so many things, you know, uh, talking about social cultural activities of, as well. When the corona outbreak, uh, you know, recently, uh, I meant at the at the initial stage of the coronavirus uh, uh, outbreak. You know, I was able to put together a documentary. You know, and I was able to do a, a outreach simultaneously to educate the populace. You know, on the streets of Lagos about this deadly virus and how they could take safety precautions. And the good thing we did about that uh, documentary and that outreach was the fact that. This outreach was documented in three different languages. So it could cut across all 54 African countries. It was documented in Swahili and it was documented in English and French, you know. And then uh, late last year, I was in Kenya, you know, uh, you know, this was part of my research and development trip and then a social cultural trip as well. And I was, um, I, I, after being hosted by Professor Pielo Lumumba, you know, one of the greatest brains on African and Africa issues on the African continent currently. And then, you know, uh, having collaboration with the government of Kajiado County uh, by, by virtue of meeting the very youngest deputy governor in Kenya, I was able to, to ally with them and see how we can, you know, we have begin engagement as regards how we can actually unite African youth from every part of the African continent together and in the world at large. So basically, okay. you know, uh, amongst other things, I have tried as much as possible to leverage on that unique status as a model to, um, to do all of this. Thank you oh, very that, much. That, thank you, that, that's very fantastic. That's fantastic. So before we continue, please, if you have, a, if you have questions, please drop it in the chat box and I'll, uh, we'll definitely ask our panelists um, those questions. So uh, this question is for, the next question is for Dr. Manali. I hope I've pronounced your name. Well. <laughs> hope you I got too. you this time. Up. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Manali, I, the question here says, um, what are the challenges that you have encountered in, ex, um, in exploring arts for cultural diplomacy? in your professional practice at home and, at, and abroad. You know, what are the challenges that you have encountered in exploring the power of arts you know, for cultural diplomacy? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, funds, financials, and expertise are the most incredible challenges that I do face in Egypt and I think you do face in Nigeria and all Africa also is facing that. But um, taking my current character and personality, I'm a positive thinking and I think quickly. I think I keep things in perspective and I like to talk positively. I also uh, think that we should cross the word failure and call it obstacles so we can overcome it 
uh, also we should cross horrible and say challenges as you just mentioned and challenges could be overcome and the downfall cross it and uh, say the setback so uh, having this as a doctrine to follow i think we can with a lot of hard work overcome any challenges or obstacles and trying to get funds from all the uh, grants and all the uh, possible um, chains to support the projects. Um, we have now um, some new ideas in, in Egypt and uh, with collaboration with uh, Conley, we can also uh, do some more with the fellowship, as you mentioned about it earlier. Um, it's come, it's became a global program and uh, we have a, a quite a good number of Egyptian fellows who have participated and joined the program this year. Uh, hopefully uh, it will grow more and more and then we can have, it's just a baby idea now, we can have an internship exchange between the fellows between Nigeria and Egypt and also training and more opportunities to overcome these challenges. Okay, thank you, Dr. Manali. Uh, okay, so uh, the other question I have for the other question I have is for Dr. Annie. You know, when you started, uh, you mentioned something about um, George Floyd and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So this question is for you. Uh, considering the political and civil unrest like Black Lives Matter, police brutality, how can art be used as a form of mediation? between the citizen and the government? Um, that's actually a good question. I, it, it all really goes back to, you've got to really find that, that commonality. And so if, if I can kind of take you into when we were creating a Black Lives Matter mural on the ground in front of um, Cincinnati City Hall, the message was to how do I show uh, my, my white counterparts or uh, the, the police structure or the governmental structure that I'm not asking for anything different than anyone else is asking for. And so there, there was a great um, person who pulled it together by, she created a poem and it simply said, we want what you want. We want to live in peace. We want to live in harmony. We want to, we want to be not judged by um, stereotypes. And so our best way that we were actually able to accomplish that um, meeting of the minds was creating this, this beautiful art on, on the street. But it went um, further than just creating art on the street. It was that springboard for dialogue and conversation. And actually a lot of um, the governmental structure then began to, to realize Wow, I, I think it was a combination of being locked down through COVID and being able to kind of step in our shoes a little bit. And we were able to create conversations and also build it to a place of empathy and not just sympathy, where they were able to put themselves into our shoes as, as well and, and make things happen. So I hope that kind of helped explain just how that art, art can do that because it is so non-threatening and, and I actually happen to work in a beautiful art form of mixed media. So I use very bright, vibrant colors that the imagery that I use isn't very graphic. Like give you example, when I did a painting, I didn't put a, a re uh, counting of the officer's knee on the person's neck. I used bright colors that drew the people in and then we were able to, to draw out conversation once I brought them in through that, that sense of commonality. Wow, art is powerful then. <laughs> yeah, art is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that, uh, Annie Ruth. And um, this, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Manali, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, personally, I think that arts offer opportunity for self-expression and exploration that is unlike any other forms of therapy. And in my personal experience of working as art therapist, 
it allowed me to discover myself and see myself in fully details that I didn't know and I wasn't aware before. And for the first time, I witnessed that. So it gave me an opportunity to explore myself in a new, a unique way and, I, and in a safe way as well. And I think that sharing that with others would exactly do the same so they can discover themselves and be in, in a safe space where you can discover it and as many times as you need to and in whatever way that you need to. Oh, okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mubaraka, uh, Mubarak, uh, what do you have to say about that, you know, using ads, you know, for in the in the situation of civil unrest? I mean, you, in Nigeria last year, October, we had a, a situation of NSAS. So um, how do you think, uh, you know, how do you think art was a form of mediation? Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, first off, I was going to say that I had goosebumps when, um, Madam Hani Ruth was having, I uh, was talking about uh, the, the, how they were able to do so many things with the art and what have you. So uh, in honesty, art is very, very powerful and then it connects with virtually everything around us. You know, and talking about the, the um, NSAS protest, you know, it's something that really came, uh, you know, all of a sudden and I was so, so happy about it, I must confess, because I felt for the very first time in my life as, as an African youth, I felt um, the Nigerian youth were awoken. Like we, it was, it was more like the sleeping giants were, were you know, were tapped you know, to, to actually uh, wake up. And trust me, I was at the forefront as well of this protest because I, was, I wasn't doing any other thing that particular week. I was always going to the protest and I saw so many creative methods that were used by African, uh, by, by Nigerian youth to actually uh, drive this wonderful movement. You know, I could remember, uh, I could remember uh, personally sharing uh, 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 face masks that were actually made by, uh, by wonderful grassroots uh, designers, you know, to, to, uh, to protesters who were actually converging together to to, uh, to express their plight, to actually um, uh, uh, express the, the heart they feel for, for, for this old change that they yearn for. You know, and I saw, I saw so many artistic, uh, you know, there were so many choreographies on the streets. There was a whole lot of paintings on the street as well. There were hope, a, a lot of, you know, uh, paintings on the, on the roads. You know, uh, Roka's boats were shut down. There was a whole lot of uh, uh, cards, you know, uh, with, with fantastic and powerful words, you know, drawings. You know, we had we had shirts. I could remember we also shared shirts, and then we had uh, fantastic calligraphies, uh, you know, to, to express our plight and how we felt, and then to communicate to, to to the government as well. And I could remember there's a friend of mine who happens to be one of the best agro-realism artists here in Nigeria, you know, he's currently in, uh, in the UK doing a show currently. He, he, he started up uh, uh, a certain uh, uh, concept called hyper, uh, uh, contemporary realism, you know, which means contemporary art, you know, uh, in, you know, uh, in, uh, merging contemporary arts with hyper realism. And he has been able to leverage on that to, 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 to actually, um, uh, as a medium for its own advocacy. So I believe that art, you know, connects so much in several, several realms. And then art also co co connects to our history as well. You know, and I think most of all, art is actually very, very therapeutic as well. And then, you know, more than ever, uh, our very own brother, Uncle Pule Adewale has proven that to us beyond all reasonable doubt. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bakari. Uh, um, I have just one more question for uh, Annie Ruth. Do you think uh, young people are really doing enough in using art as a tool for, um, for any kind of change or for any form of mediation? Do you think young people are really doing enough? Oh, the question is, do I think young people are doing enough? 
yeah. um, enough in terms of that area of using arts um, for mediation. And I, I, I would say the young people are awesome. Um, I have to also, uh, I'm in the generation, like I'll, I'll be 58 this year. And so what I've realized too amongst my generation is that we also have to be reminded that even though the young people are doing enough, they still need the wisdom and guidance of the mamas and the elders. And we, we can't take the approach, and I have to shift back to the elders, we can't take the approach that I can simply just pass the baton and say, go, because the young people still need that guidance and wisdom that we have. But I must commend the young people. They are doing so much. Uh, so much innovation comes from them. So much strength comes from our young people across the continents. I mean, I'm talking about in Nigeria, in, in, in Kenya, and even in the United States, the passion. I have to be honest with you, I ha hands off to, to Kunle. He has boundless energy. I'm like, wow. It's just like, he's a really great example of a young person who is doing but at the same time, he's right there in the middle of being that young person and that elder. So he's passing it on. He's helping to hone and, and train other people. So um, hats off. Um, you, you've heard it straight from Mama Annie Ruth. Yes, the young people are doing enough, but we can always do more. The work never has an end. There, there is so much more to do. The key is keep passing it on keep nurturing and training. Fantastic. All right, thank you, Mama. <laughs> thank you, Mama. Thank you for the wisdom you, you shared with us this, um, this afternoon or this morning. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so um, last one. I'd like to okay. say something. I'd like to say forward. something as well. Okay. Oh, okay. I think, I, I think ladies first. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Manale, we are listening. Yes, so we, with the help of those nice people, I would like all the attendees, put your hands on your heart for a moment to wish yourself well and to try praying for Conley to be celebrated next year 2022 in 49 states of the u.s not only in cincinnati <laughs> god bless you conley okay thank you dr manali thank you so much okay thank you for that right so i, I was going to talk about uh, i was just going to buttress the point uh madam annie rock uh, annie ruth talked about, you know, which I totally uh, could relate with so much, you know, uh, I, and I think another thing that we young people need to do is to actually take it from, uh, you know, the basics, basically, you know, how we dress. For instance, you know, as a model, uh, in recent time, I was able to uh, champion and produce a certain uh, fashion documentary film that talked about a certain um, uh, African traditional and woven fabric similar to this I'm wearing, it's called Ashoke. And Ashoke is so artistic that uh, personally for me, I personally connect with Ashoke a lot. And that's the more reason why I tend to have a touch of it in anything I wear, you know, every single day. And what I did was I was able to collaborate with the Africa Fashion Week London and Sustainable Fashion Week New York to produce this, um, wonderful uh, fashion documentary film that talks so much about uh, uh, the Ashoke, you know, it, it, like it, we, we took the audience through the process of making, uh, you know, every single process of making this Ashoke. And then we were able to actually show the world how we can be spontaneous about making them into contemporary African wear. And I did something really interesting just at the, uh, at the first, um, uh, uh, lockdown Eve, you know, in Nigeria. It was about the same time, coincidentally, when the whole Black Lives Matter movement was happening. And then I was able to do simultaneous, uh, uh, a simultaneous equation. I was able to bring together diplomats from, you know, I had two friends who were vice consuls at the US Consulate General. I had an officer 
an official of the uh, British High Commission. I had another, uh, I had two other officers from uh, the, the French consulate. I had uh, a Senegalese, I had, so basically he was made as a, 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 a multicultural mixer, you know, such that we used that, we leveraged on that to actually preach uh, our, our own message of, of, you know, of kicking against racism and colorism across the world. And also I was able to now show, uh, you know, for the very first time I was able to debut this fashion documentary film about this wonderful uh, artistic Ashoke to this uh, wonderful audience. He was so electrifying. Wow. You know, afterwards, I'll probably send a publication and a trailer video of it for everybody to see. So I think, um, you know, to buttress Madam Annie's uh, point, we need to, we youths need to be at the forefront of doing this. And I would always, like I would always say, we have twice as much work to do as African youths and as, uh, 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 as youths across the globe, you know, to, 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 to leverage on every, every single artistic uh, 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 capacity of ours to make the world a better place. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mubarak. Thank you. That's very creative of you. And uh, I, before, before we round up, I just want to acknowledge uh, the presence of Dr. Ab Ayobami Oyedare. Um, he's the CEO of Royal Young African Leadership Forum of His Imperial Majesty, uh, the Oni of Ife. And, uh, um, and also just to let us know that the next session starts at 4.50 p.m. Uh, and we'll be talking about international exchange and opportunities. This is for everyone who is interested in being part of a global community. So thank you, Madam Annie Ruth. Thank you for your time. I've really learned from your wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Manali Elewa. Finally, I think I've learned to pronounce your name. <laughs> and thank you to the tallest man in Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> it, it was nice talking with you. Thank you very much. All right, back to you, Esther. Okay, uh, before, before we round up, do we have questions? Please, if you have questions, just signify by raising your hand, just one or two questions um, for any of the panelists. Do we have that? Uh, is anyone signifying? Okay. Uh, oh. Do we have questions or should we go ahead to the next session? Okay. Okay, so I guess I should hand over to the uh, to doc, uh, to Mr. Kunle. Do we have something to add to to this? Mr. Kunle, are you there? Yeah, I just joined. Uh, Okay, so okay, Mr. Kunle just uh, sent me a message that his internet is misbehaving. So uh, I'm here. Okay, Mr. Okay, finally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you can you hear me? Yes, very well, very well. I have to say to to what the panelists have just um, discussed. Just a few, one or two sentences from you. Yeah, yeah thanks so much. I uh, really want to appreciate first. Oh, the internet is acting up. Uh, 
This is another challenge, the internet. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Mr. Kule, are you there? Oh, the internet is uh, actually acting up. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Can the host probably play a documentary while we wait for Mr. Kunle? Because the internet is really, really acting up. Yeah, I wanted to say while we're, while we're waiting on them, uh, in terms of really uh, building bridges, uh, it really happened. Uh, I really saw the light on my last trip to Nigeria, which was in 2019. And so I had met many new uh, Nigerian sisters for the first time. And so what I said to them, I said, I am Africa. I am Nigeria. And so the demonstration I used was I, I, I grabbed one daughter and I kept her really close. And I sent the other daughter across the room. And so then I asked the women the question, which of these two are my daughters? Is the one, so just because the one was across the room didn't make her any less my daughter than the one that was right there in my bosom. So I think when we, we, we give examples and we, we show people that um, we are so similar and we're all and we're all family and they can see it visually either through music or, or paintings or poetry, then it, it resonates within their spirit, within their soul, and they really get the message. And so I was able to leave that day where I had met new Nigerian sisters for the first time, but we all felt that kinship afterwards. So I thought I'd share that with everybody. That was such a blessing to me. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Ali. Keep giving us wisdom back to back. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I'm going to try we wait for uh, the internet to uh, why wait for uh, Mr. Kunle. Um, I'm going through the chats here. Someone says uh, people like Buke from Jell Africa and I seven young entrepreneurs. Someone that someone made mention of uh, the Ashoke that uh, Bakari Barak talked about. Okay, uh, Mr. Kune is back. Yeah. Um, Finally, thank you so welcome. Thank you so much. I had to switch to my phone. It's so funny. I don't know what's happening to the internet today. Um, I just want to use this uh, opportunity to thank everyone for attending the Kunle Adewale Day, the first session for today, which uh, highlight um, art um, for cultural diplomacy and also how art can be used to build bridges. 
are used as a form of mediation between people in, uh, in the government and the citizen. And today we've had incredible session uh, from uh, our fantastic panelists today, all the way from um, United States, Mama Eni Roots, who is like, uh, like a big mama to me in the US. Uh, what I had in mind before was to like, you know, celebrate the Kunla Dewali in the US, this, but because of the pandemic, I'm with my family this year. But most importantly, we we're, were able to connect together and still being able to uh, celebrate the Kunle Adewale Day. So a big thank you to Mama Ine Ruth. I, you know, I, I'm also like inspired by how, uh, you know, that intergenerational engagement, you look at her like she, she will be 58 this year. So the question for young people in this room today, what are you doing with your life? This is a song with about close to her 60 and then she is still very much involved in community engagement through you know the use of art so let's start thinking about how what we're doing and how we're doing what we're doing i also want to commend and appreciate uh dr manel lewa uh who is the board member of the art and medicine fellowship program in the u.s uh sorry in egypt. <laughs> in, egypt. <laughs> in egypt sorry he's like i want to i want to take out to take out to us Right, so we just want to thank her uh, for all our incredible input in the fellowship program and also ensuring representation, a huge representation from Egypt in the Global Art Medicine Fellowship Program. I see how we, you know, we're building relationships and building bridges in terms of practice and discipline and what we can do culturally, you know, together um, as uh, African countries as it were. So I want to say a big thank you to you and also want to thank my big brother. Um, Bakari Mubarak, uh, the tallest model in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for all his valuable input in today's Kunladewale Day, especially in this area of, uh, you know, utilizing culture to connect, to build relationship, to inspire social change. I've been part of advocacy and social change. So I want to say a big thank you to you. I want to thank um, Jennifer Fultz, who is the deputy uh, public affairs of the U.S. Consulate, Lagos, Nigeria, also representing the U.S. Mission Nigeria in today's event. A big thank you to her uh, and all the support of the U.S. Mission over the years uh, in the engagement that have been involved with also with my organization here in Nigeria. I thank to Dr. Ayobami, uh, the CEO of the Royal African Leadership Forum of the His Imperial uh, Majesty, the Honor of Ife, for being attended today. But a thanks to everybody for making it so far in this uh, fourth session of today's program. Uh, the second session of the program today will be starting around 4.50 p.m. Uh, for people who are interested in exchange program, like Glo Global Brain Health Program, Global Good, Chevening Scholar, Obama Scholar. So we have a lot of uh, amazing people who are coming to share global opportunities and exchange program with us by 4.50 p.m. today. So I would also want to say that try to join in our time. I remember that last year when we hosted the Kunle Adewale Day, we had International Day of Opportunity and Exchange Programs. And one of the good news that came out of that was that one of the persons that attended the Kunle Adewale Day last year, uh, that, that also attended the uh, International Exchange Program, this summer actually, he, he got a scholarship to go to the Global Brain Health Institute pro program in Tr Trinity College in Dublin in the UK. And uh, this is all funded program. So it's going to be in the UK, in Ireland for one year. In a one full, fully funded program uh, valued about 100,000 euros. All funded because he attended the Kunle Adewale Day last year. And then he applied, you know, the, those that came around talk about the exchange program. He applied and today, this summer, will be in. Dublin for one year fully funded program. So this is another opportunity. I don't know who will be willing to attend. I don't know who's going to be the next person who is going to be traveling either to UK, to US, or any part of the world because of this. So I want to say big thanks to the host, Oyinye uh, Oba. A very big thank you to you and to everyone who came today to be part of the Kunle Adewale Day. We deeply appreciate you. We deeply celebrate you. Thanks so much. Remember the Kunle Adewale Day 
is not celebrated is not a celebration of a celebrity is a celebration of our humanity. I do not consider myself as a celebrity. I tell people I'm not a celebrity artist, so I don't. You don't see me wearing shoulder pad or carrying myself in a way that is not really befitting. Uh, I carry myself as a servant leader because for me, my life is all about serving humanity and serving people and providing platform for other people to come up higher. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. A big thank you. If you, want to, if you are interested in the Global Fellowship Program, Opportunity and Exchange Program, join us by 4.50 p.m. today. Thanks so much. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you. Goodbye, everyone.